On a belter of a summer's day, the fate of a bunch of lads from Kent took a massive turn. The police in Britain nipped in the bud a cheeky plot to sneak a deadly load of automatic shooters from Europe, across the Channel and up the River Medway, right into Kent. Harry Schilling, a young lad of just 25, and his right-hand men, had snagged these weapons off the back of a lorry in Slovakia, where they'd been tinkered with to work again. The crew had smuggled this hefty stash over from Boulogne, France, in August 2015, using a yacht they'd picked up just for this dodgy job. But the National Crime Agency, NCA, had had their eyes on this mob since March, thanks to a heads-up from the Kent coppers, and the officers were ready and waiting to pounce as soon as the yacht docked. Mind-blowingly, the very same dodgy dealer who sorted them out had also supplied gear to the nutters, who'd done in 12 people at the Charlie Hebdo mag in Paris just half a year before. This turned out to be the biggest haul of automatic weapons the mainland UK had ever seen. So, here's the mad story of how digging into a crime family from Kent led to slapping five blokes with a total of 90 years behind bars. Welcome to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel, where I unravel the veiled tales of cryptic crimes. The squad was on the police's radar for a good few years, with Harry Schilling running the show. They'd been under the watchful eye for a while, when word got out they were planning to dabble in shifting handguns into the UK. It was a bit of a shocker since they'd never messed with firearms before. But they weren't exactly mugs, were they? A bit of nosy Parker work in a boozer near the River Medway clued in the coppers that one of the crew was on his mobile, browsing for boats up for grabs. This got the detective's antennae twitching. Proper intrigued they were. The River Medway's this river down southeast England way. It kicks off in the High Weald, West Sussex, and snakes through Tunbridge, Maidstone, and the Medway towns in Kent, before spilling into the Thames estuary near Sheerness. That's a trek of 70 miles, that is. Come the 10th of August 2015, the Albanian motor cruiser was making its way up the river, steered by skipper David Payne. It had left Bologna a few hours back, aiming for Cuxton with a sneaky detour to Rochester. Little did Payne know, every move he made was being clocked by a squad of armed, watchful sorts from the National Crime Agency. The police first got a gander at David Payne, down the local in Cookston, where he was having a chinwag with one of his underlings. One thing that got the copper's attention was Payne glued to his phone or tablet, eyeballing boats. This set off the old something's fishy alarm and got them proper curious about what these lads were plotting. They were after a yacht, a big one at that, and the Dibble were dead certain these geezers were planning to nip across the Channel or even further into Europe. France, Belgium or maybe the Netherlands seemed like the hot spots. From then on, the 38-foot Albanina became the apple of the NCA's eye, with officers on it, like a car bonnet, day and night. Payne's mates were all hands on deck with the boat, and the police were convinced something big was brewing. They were all set to pounce, ready to protect the public and their own, while gathering the dirt needed to nab them proper. Keeping the gang under watch and collecting evidence for a bang to rights case was top of the agenda. The surveillance team parked their van in various spots, finally picking a prime location with a cracking view of where the Albanina was tied up in sandwich. When David Payne shoved off from the marina, aiming for the channel, the coppers were still in the dark about whether he was on a wild goose chase or if this was the real McCoy. That left them having to scramble officers on the off chance the boat came back chock-a-block with dodgy firearms. On the day the Albanina made its way back, Payne was flying solo on the yacht. The detectives were in a pickle, not knowing if he'd have company on the return trip. The intel was as clear as mud regarding where he was off to or even what he was after. But piecing together his dodgy moves and shifty behaviour, they reckoned something criminal was going down. The squad had to be on their toes, ready to leap into action with nary a clue about what was hidden in the Albanina's belly. After necking his pint, Payne legged it back from Rochester High Street to the Albanina, clueless that the NCA's eyes were glued on him. Now, with the yacht moored up in a Medway marina, packed to the rafters with lethal shooters, it could have been a doddle for the crew to offload the gear and get it moving. But the NCA needed solid proof to tie Payne and Harry Schilling together. So they opted to play the long game, keeping a beady eye on the vessel and biding their time. One massive headache for the Dibble was how Harry Schilling had been proper clever in running the show. The detectives were having a mare trying to solidly tie Harry Schilling to the boat. Proving his links to David Payne in court was going to be tough, let alone bridging the massive gap to connect him directly to the firearms. If the police swooped in to nick the gats and nip the threat in the bud, Harry Schilling and his top mates would still be out and about. 
they'd still have their mitts on the weapons. They could easily give it another go, just like they do with gear and other dodgy dealings. Their wait-and-see game paid off when, out of nowhere, a white van rocked up next to the boat. The coppers eyeballed a few blokes unloading what looked like hefty suitcases from the boat to the van. The fact these geezers were donning blue gloves, keen as mustard to dodge leaving any DNA, made the whole scene even more suspect. The police were bang on. This was the moment they'd been hanging about for. As the white van made its way up the dirt track to hit the main road, four patrol motors came tearing round the corner, boxing it in proper sharpish. The bus to nick the dodgy cargo was a blinder. They found 22 AK-47 type shooters, nine Scorpion machine pistols, and a stash of over a thousand rounds of ammo. Collars were felt, but the job wasn't done by a long chalk. Harry Schilling was still in the dark that David Payne had been nicked and the firearms nabbed. Then, the Dibble got a tip-off that Schilling and his cronies were mobile, in a motor and hitting the road. With time ticking, the coppers knew they had to get these lads in cuffs sharpish. If they sussed out Payne was out of the game, they'd vanish quicker than a Friday paycheck. Schilling and his mob knew they'd be staring down the barrel of 20 years plus if they got caught, so the Dibble had to move fast to take back control. The AMPR, Automatic Number Plate Recognition, was on fire, showing a motor linked to Schilling heading towards Orpington, pulling up at a DIY shop in a retail park. The police spotted a vehicle tied to this OCG park cheeky-like in a disabled spot and set up a stakeout, waiting for them to return to the motor. True as night follows day, they clocked them coming out of home base, loaded up with shovels and gear you'd use for digging a big old hole, likely to stash something they shouldn't. Then in a flash, a swarm of motors rolled into the car park, and doors flew open as a dozen armed dibbles swooped on the pair in seconds flat. By this point, David Payne, the geezer steering the Albanina, and Christopher Owen, who'd been caught unloading the shooters, were both in the bag. Meanwhile, at a suburban DIY shop, Harry Schilling and his partner in crime, Michael Dufresne, and Schilling's link over in Europe, got nabbed while they were picking up gear to stash their arsenal. Schilling was so gobsmacked by the bust that he ended up needing a bit of oxygen, what with him having a panic attack and all. Once they got him settled, the Dibble clocked that a third member of their little tea party was missing from the scene. CCTV at the home base caught a third bloke, Richard Rye, Schilling's right-hand man, and now the coppers were on a tight clock to collar him too. The CCTV caught an officer on the hunt for Rye, spotting him sat near a window, fidgeting with a long cardboard box in front of him. Rye was getting jittery, watching his mates getting nicked, and was glued to the window, trying to tip off the rest of their crew on his mobile. The officer hung back for backup before making a move, but before help showed up, Richard Rye made to leg it out of McDonald's with the box, forcing the officer to jump into action solo, quickly backed up by two mates from the undercover squad. Just like that, the whole scheme and the lives of these blokes were up in smoke. After the initial bust, the operation shifted gears, with the Dibble raiding houses, properties and motors for more evidence. Tucked away in the vehicle parked at home base, they found a couple of mobiles that would end up being gold dust for the trial. These weren't your bog-standard mobiles. They were kitted out with PGP, pretty good privacy, encryption. Cracking into them was the big headache for the coppers. Michael Dufresne's phone got shipped off to the Met in London, but even they were having a mare trying to get in. Harry Schilling's mobile was flown out to Canada, banking on the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's knack for breaking into these encrypted networks. The Canadians were top-notch at this game, especially since a lot of these encryption tricks started in their backyard, used by the underworld. The jackpot was hitting a message from Schilling bragging, we now officially gangsters, and another from Dufresne, boasting they were proper heavy and armed to the teeth. After all the graft, nicking them at Cuxton Marina in Alpington and the McDonald's bust, the hard yards were done. But what was next for the accused was down to the beacon jury at the most notorious nick in the world, dragging on for a seven-week slog. The sheer scale of the trouble this mob could have caused wasn't lost on the powers that be. During the trial, the accused were ferried to and from the Old Bailey with no expense spared. Think police convoys, choppers buzzing the skies, and armed dibble marching the streets. The cost for this heavy-duty escort? A hefty £720,000. For the first time since the infamous £53 million Securitas Depot robbery trial in Tonbridge in 2008, armed plod were allowed inside the iconic courthouse. 
The jury lot were kept under wraps, totally cut off, with even a strip of police tape in the public gallery to keep prying eyes at bay. Judge Marco Topolsky QC threw the book at them, handing down a whopping combined sentence of more than 90 years. In his closing remarks, he didn't mince his words, telling them straight that they hadn't spared a single thought for the untold damage they could have unleashed. He laid it on thick, saying the whole dodgy operation could have kicked off mayhem on an absolutely chilling scale. The shooters were the real deal, fully automatic, in top nick. They were serious hardware. Some of these weapons were cocked, locked and ready to rock. Schilling got banged up for a solid 30 years in the clink, plus a five-year extended license on top for smuggling guns and having them with the intent to cause serious grief. Dufresne landed himself 27 years behind bars, with the same five-year extended license for the same dodgy dealings. The other three lads, David Payne, Richard Rye and Christopher Owen Rochester, had already held their hands up at an earlier session and got their own stretches for being part of this crafty operation. Payne and Rye were each handed 19 years. Owen, who got nabbed with a couple of bullets in his pocket, ended up with five years and four months for playing a smaller part. The sentences they got handed are hefty by UK standards, especially for dealing in weapons. It's a game with stakes way higher than many other serious offences. Getting mixed up in the arms trade? That's a mugs game, no two ways about it. Drop your thoughts and feedback in the comments section down below. If you reckon my sleuthing breakdown's been a bit of an eye-opener, make sure you like this vid, share it with your mates and subscribe to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel. Don't skip on bashing the bell icon as well, so you're in the loop every time I drop a new video. I value your support massively and can't wait to catch up with you tomorrow. Until then, keep that curiosity alive and never stop hunting for the truth.